Welcome to the Business Vitality Podcast. My name is Katherine Canty. I am the host and an executive coach. I work with teams, individuals, and leaders to help create a measured leadership change. We do that using practical application, and our clients are creating 100% measured results as seen by those around them. Not necessarily what I think or what they think, but what the other people are seeing. And they are being recognized for the hard work that they're doing. If you're interested in learning more about some of the work that we're doing, you can learn more at KatherineCanty.com. I would love for you to subscribe to this show, to Business Vitality. This is my way to continue to pay it forward and share business best practices. Stay tuned and listen to the interview. Thanks for being here. Mustafa Morsi, you are the president of Push Analytics, found on the web at pushanalytics.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Catherine, thank you for having us. All right. So we had a great pre-recording conversation, and I just want to jump right in. Tell me a little bit about the business. Give give our listeners a little background on the work that you're doing right now. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so Push Analytics, we're a full service digital agency. Uh, we're a top tier HubSpot partner. Um, you know, we help engineer businesses uh, for growth and for success, and helping them go, uh, you know, efficiently. Uh, right. So, uh, we really dive in. We work a lot of types of businesses, um, and really dive in, and uh, you know see how we can help them and help them grow. And there's a lot of different ways we do that. We do ads, we do uh, process development, CRM implementation, you know, a lot of different things there. Okay, so I tend to, I've spent 20 years in corporate, I've spent time in construction, 20 some odd years in construction. Um, I tend to gravitate towards where relationships are more important than a CRM automation process. So I'm gonna challenge you to, you know, how do we shift mindsets where, it's always worked. We've always been able to call our buddy who knew somebody who could get us into a job. So just for the fun of it, because you both we both talked about construction before we hit record. If we're doing B2B construction, business development, you know, and what we've always done has worked amazingly. What where do we start if if we're out there riding around talking to people, going to events? Um our cell phone just opens up whatever door we need. So where do we start? Maybe the next generation comes in and they don't have my cell phone that can get them into anything. They don't have that backstory of how to open up a door to go talk to somebody. Do you think there's benefit first for the folks that have been doing it this way to even consider something like this? Or is there a bigger benefit to the next generation that's coming in? He's probably got 10, 15 years in construction, but they don't have the Rolodex of, of the guy or the woman that's been doing it for a long time yeah no great question great starting point so so first of all i mean we have to realize that these two things that you mentioned are not um they're not like in clash with each other so you can have relationships and that's actually really really important and construction is you know always uh, a big element of it is being a relationship business um but you can still have processes and you can still have crm and they're not in clash with each other and i think what people don't um, realize, and I've done this and I had relationships and, you know, built them in what people don't realize is that even, even with that, right. Um, things will fall between the cracks, right? So you, you, you know, especially as you grow, as you do things, right. Like, um, a lot of times people are like, you know, Hey, well, I'm just a good, you know, business person or salesperson or whatever. And like, I don't need anything. I don't need any process. Like I'll just do it. And, And first of all, that means two things. One, they probably have a process. It's just not, right now or fleshed out they just they do have something right it's like yeah i I sit down every monday i drink coffee and i you know i I call 20 people that's still a process right so i think uh but you could formalize that a little bit more maybe organize it but that's still a process that's number one but number two if they really don't write anything down or anything um they um uh if they really don't write anything down or do anything they um you know things are probably falling between the cracks on some level so if i had to call 40 people this week and I'm extraordinarily good. Well, extraordinarily good. Maybe I'll call 36 of them, but then I might've missed four. Right. And then, um, you know, in construction that, you know, that could be one of them could have been landed into a project eventually. Um, and that could be a lot of money. <laughs> like, right. So I think that's, a, that's kind of the, the first thing I, I would tell people, um, that are in that, that are in that space is like, um, Hey, like, you know, I'm sure you're doing a great job and uh, we don't want to take that away. And none of this is in clash with what you're doing and all the relationship stuff you have, but you do want to anchor it in a way so that things don't fall between the cracks. Um, and, I, and I think that's like the first the first angle of it. 
Uh, but beyond that, right, there's more There's more to it, obviously. So when you don't have, and, and even taking a step back from like, it, it's not really CRM specifically or anything. Like CRM is, is a good kind of quarterback for a lot of this stuff in the implementation side. But when you don't have good processes, uh, ultimately, uh, you lose out on other things too. So transferability. So if you have uh, somebody going out on vacation or they're sick or they have a kid or whatever, right? And it's just like, you know, uh, when you don't have anything at all, it's like, what do we do? And then you scramble, like, right? If you if you if you see that and you're like, you know, really reliant on certain people being there every day, um, then you know that like, hey, you know, we need some element of like process or writing stuff down or, or CRM or writing it on a napkin or whatever, right? So that way, um, common by the way in the construction industry, but but that way, um, you know, you can um, if somebody's out, then you have some sort of way to transfer things like hey look listen joe's out you're gonna take over here's the stuff he's working on like you know uh here's the notes here's the whatever you know you can you kind of take over there so um there's a lot of benefits like that um and i can keep going um right but, but i want to leave if you have more questions there but there's a lot of benefits like that um where it's like we have to really realize um that you, you can you can gain a lot even if you already are uh, have good relationships on our on, on on a tear okay so where do you start with processes because some people when they're just getting started they just open up a word document and they just start typing that's very time consuming what are maybe a couple of your ideas that can just like go ahead and leapfrog this sop document yeah for sure we actually have a whole framework that we um we use to basically uh, understand the different aspects of the business um and if we were in a webinar setting i would share that but um basically um though the way that you the way that you want to start is you want to think of, hey, where am I today? You need to really understand where you are today, right? And whenever we're doing any any of this with anybody, we sit down, we're like, what do you do today? Tell us what you do. There's no like wrong answer, but just tell us what you do, right? Like, how do you do it? How do you get your sales? How do you do things? And, and um, you know, if I'm presenting like a webinar, we were just actually giving a giving a course last week um, as part of like a digital bootcamp program. And, and like, we have like kind of a question of like, where are you processed today? And um, it's a little bit of a trick question because when people say I don't have processes, we're like, well, that's that's not possible, right? Because it, ultimately, a process is just like a series of steps to do something, right? So mm -hmm. it's just like when you know somebody tells somebody else, like, hey, I'm on a diet, and the other person's like, I'm not on a diet, and he's like, well, you are, but you know, your diet is that you just don't care, right? Mm -hmm. um, right? So it's still a diet though, because um, diet is just what you eat. So it's the same thing, and actually, process is kind of the same to the business as diet is to to the body, um, but. Um, Anyhow, the um, so understanding where you are, right? Because whether you like it or not, you have processes that you're either paying attention to them or you're not, right? You have diet, you're either paying attention to it or you're, you're just eating junk food, right? So, um, so uh, really understanding uh, that piece of it and understanding where you would like to go or like what are the kind of the metrics for success? What what is success look like? And sitting there and defining all that, and then moving in the direction of like you know mm -hmm. getting there. And this is an iterative thing. It's not. You don't like want to do like one time you're like all right we took a look at our processes and like we're never gonna look at them again but that's not things change things evolve you hire people you, you know whatever right you grow you don't grow whatever right? things change and your objectives change and you need to recalibrate things uh you know maybe you were planning on like really growing then you decided for whatever reason that like hey actually we we'd like to stabilize here and you know do things a different way or whatever right so things change a lot of things change you can't just leave it the way it is um, but it's definitely, um, I would definitely say that whatever time you invest, especially if you've never looked at your process, you do want to spend some time on this, right? If you know, it, it, it's, it's well worth it. Um, what, what kind of tech comes to mind? I mean, obviously not just word documents, but what else comes to mind when you're thinking about SOP and just making it easier? Oh, I like, I mean, when actually designing the SOP or implementing the actual process. Both. Okay, well, implementing I'll get to, but designing the SOP. I mean, we we love flowcharting, right? I, I think flowcharting is an excellent way to do it. I think it's even way more valuable than even just writing out a word document. Um, I also kind of feel like nobody really reads anymore, <laughs> so people, right. um, you know, I, I am a reader. I grew up a reader, but like I do feel like nobody really reads anymore. Even even me now, there's just so much information that like. I just need something that I can look at really quickly. So uh, we like flow charting. I think flow charting is very effective. I think it also gets people on the same page. Like, here's what's happening. Here's different scenarios that could happen, right? Like, um, 
you know, we might call a customer and then it's like, there's five different outcomes that could happen from us calling a customer. And then like what happens in each one. And I think that's like very, very important. Uh, when I was in construction and uh, at the time where I was managing like our distribution area, um, I was talking to you about that before. Um, one of the things we wanted to do was get uh, kind of our distributors um, to just like be able to follow up more effectively um, for, um, you know, for jobs, right? Because it was like a big part of it. And anybody who's in construction knows that. And uh, yeah, I devised like a little, um, like a program kind of where it was like, okay, like, you know, we're going to, we're going to do like this, co these competitions or whatever. And like, you know, it, one of the things you had to do is like, you had to follow up, but we kind of laid out all the possible outcomes that could happen from a follow up. And you had to like, you had to follow up until you got to one of them, right? Like the other, the project got canceled, the project got moved or the project got there. So they told you call back and you call back and like all these outcomes that uh, could happen. Uh, right. And I was very familiar with all of them because I had done it for a while um you know um and that's like really important right and you know when you're doing a flow chart you can you can do that you can be like okay we're going to do this and then all these six things can happen what are we going to do in each one of these cases and then you kind of start laying things out and then you might also realize when you're doing that things that you didn't know before because you might be like oh okay we follow up and we do a great job following up and when they pick up we do great but when they don't or when they say they're busy we don't do anything we forget right like it's just like okay i call them all on monday and then the guys that pick up pick up and the guys that don't Oh, well, <laughs> if they call me back, they call me back. But like, other than that, I don't really, I don't really try. Right. So you might realize that there's gaps, right? You might realize there's gaps or, oh, you know, hey, a lot of times we do follow up and then they say, hey, project's on hold. Um, and we don't ask, well, when do you expect that there's going to be an update or whatever? And then when should we follow up next? Yeah, again, right. Maybe you do that. Maybe you don't. But you're going to start noticing gaps on the different scenarios there. And that's going to be like very important. So I think flow charting is a very powerful way to do this. And it's a lot easier than also sitting down and just, you know, staring at a blank piece of paper and writing stuff. Yeah, it's discouraging if that's what you're doing is opening up the computer and you're typing up, gosh, I wonder how you document XYZ process. I mean, it's just, A, it's boring. B, nobody's going to read it. And C, you're going to miss a bunch of steps. So I like your idea when it comes to flow charting and um, being able to capture the different scenarios and all the little one-offs, because there's a lot of one-offs that continue to happen that we're probably not not catching. No, for say. sure. And, and I would actually uh, also give the tip of... Um, don't uh i mean if you're going to do this if you have somebody doing it for you obviously they're going to ask you the questions but if if you're kind of doing it yourself or internally or whatever have somebody talk to somebody and let them or you can even take turns if you guys are both like part of the executive team or whatever team is doing this um take turns and have maybe somebody ask questions and somebody right even if you're both familiar with the business uh because that makes it a lot easier right like even for myself when we're doing stuff internally for our own company it's just like and we do this a lot for other people, but like when we're doing it for ourselves, it's like a lot easier sometimes to like just talk through things as opposed to just sit down and like, you know, be at a keyboard. It's not as intuitive of a starting point. Right. But it's really easy to talk. If you tell a business owner, hey, tell me about your business. They can sit there and just talk about it. Right. And then somebody else could take the notes and start mapping out and then be like, hey, well, this is what it looks like. Oh, yeah. Cool. All right. You forgot this. And then it, that will make it a lot easier to get started. All right, so I'm even lazier than that. I'll just listen to people talk and ask questions and then get a transcript. So I'll either record it and then dump it into Otter or dump it somewhere yeah. else and then get it all written. <laughs> and then probably use Chat GPT to like clean it up a little bit and then rescan it. And I'm like, well, that's pretty darn close. I think we're gonna go with that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could definitely do that. And and uh, a lot of times, yeah, we do we do do that as well. Recommending like kind of because a lot of info gets like you know dropped in the, in these sessions uh yeah. but there is like kind of a value to interactively doing it like i'm mm -hmm. imagining like if you and you know again the other the other executive team or whatever or your partner sitting in a room and you're like hey let's just figure this out um mm -hmm. there is some value to like hey, let's talk and i'm gonna you talk all right okay, okay. Yeah, I, this is what i do okay boom 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 we have like these steps and that's been um uh, you know uh, that's been ways that we've solved um at the organizational level involved with like in depth with a lot of different organizations and sometimes we were like kind of more in person solving problems live and that's ways that we've solved some of these problems where it's like let's just talk and write at the same time and like we can crack like how to how to fix this okay so let's just pretend we got sops out of the way what's after sops like once you get that good foundation in place where are you taking this next to continue to um to build and i noticed on one of your posts on social media, it said, look, if the processes aren't optimized, automation is just going to cause more problems. So let's pretend in a perfect world, we got SOPs in place, we feel good about it. 
what what's next to help be able to, to well boost revenue? I would say, but before we assume that we got our so SOPs optimized, um, <laughs> but for, first of all, yeah, uh, okay. To answer to answer the first part, so um, when you um, and and I'll use this analogy here. I think uh, construction it's pretty relevant. Yeah. Um, when you have these, you know, CRM, you know, these software, whatever right, uh, tools, right? They're ultimately just tools, right? And so some that yeah, and a lot of times you get sold these tools, and it's like, oh, okay, they're great, they're amazing. Um, and they keep telling you about the features, but at the end of the day, anybody knows that like you could have the best tools ever. You don't have a house, like you don't have a building because you have tools, right? You need to have people building the tools. You need using the tools. You need to pe know when to use the right tool. You need to set up the tool. Uh, you need to train people on the tool. So it's like a whole process that goes into actually making good, effective usage of a tool. And it's the same thing with a CRM with any of these. Um, now, the uh, I would say it's not really. It's not really the SOP that goes first. In my mind, it's like the blueprint goes first of like, here's kind of the blueprint. And that's what I talked to you. That's why the flow charting is, is better because it's more abstract and quicker, uh, right? The blueprint goes first. Um, and then you start realizing like, okay, we want to do this and this and this. So now we need to plug in some tools to help us with this, right? So it's kind of, again, iterative, like, okay, we realize like we need help following up on customers. So we're going to plug in email automation here to follow up after we've sent the quote to, you know, one, two, three, and then maybe send a reminder to the, uh, sales rep to be able to do that. And it all gets built kind of in the same blueprint overall. Um, and then based on that, you can actually write the SOPs and, uh, you know, configure the tools, the CRM, all the all the tools and stuff, because you already know you already know what you need. You've already laid out the map, you've laid out the blueprint, um, you know, and then you can start. Mm -hmm. Then you can start essentially. I mean, again, it's just like construction. I mean, honestly, right? Like you, you mm -hmm. have there's a blueprint, they're designed for the building, and once that's done, um, or mostly done, I mean, things are never perfect. But like once that's kind of done, <laughs> right? You. Um, <laughs> You start buying stuff, you start buying material, you start building stuff and, and you know, and you start putting things together where you get them. You don't do that before, you, you know, you don't just, you know, hey, we don't even know what the building's going to look like, but let's just buy stuff anyways, right? I mean, like, you don't really do that before, you do it after, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I I have been known to buy things before I started building yeah. and we build around it, but that's another thing. I mean, it works, right? You can make it work, <laughs> obviously, but, but ideally, ideally you don't, right? Um. But even, I mean, even in this case, it's, not, it's never going to be ideal. You might already have, a lot of times it come people, hey, I already have two, I already have HubSpot, but like we never really used it. Or like we kind of used it. Or like uh, we don't know who set up all these automations. And, um, you know, we, can, we sit there and ask questions like, right, yo, do you need them? We don't know. What do they do? We don't know. It's like, do you have documentation? We don't know. And it's because, again, they didn't have like some sort of blueprint to go off of and intentionality. And when you, and that's why you can't start with, uh, and some people do this. They'll get like HubSpot or whatever CRM. But HubSpot's a good example because it has like a lot of features. Mm -hmm. So they'll just get HubSpot and jump in. But like the problem with that is like, well, what are you doing? Get a zoom out and like, what are we even doing, right? Mm -hmm. Like imagine you just get like, you know, you get sheetrock and just start putting it up. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like where, where is it going? What are you trying to build? What's this room supposed to look like? You have to know that. Uh, otherwise, it's really, really you end up in situations where like a year later you have like 30 automations or 100 automations and you're like i have no idea what any of these are and like i don't know if they're important or not i don't know if we're using them or not and we see this a lot we see this a lot so um really having that blueprint first and then jumping in is like very very important okay blueprint let me make sure i got this blueprint with flow charting so you got your good old mm -hmm. foundational we got to get a game plan before we get in here you identify what you need help with, whether it's following up with customers, you need sales rep reminders, you need all these like triggers that are going to go off. And then you're able to write your SOPs and configure the systems. And then at that point you go and you buy the materials or you buy the HubSpot or you buy whatever yep. the solutions are to, to put this automation in place. Yep. And again, you may already have a CRM you're not using. That's fine, right? I mean, oh, that, everybody's got a CRM they're not really yeah, using. That, that's I mean, fine. Everybody I've ever met. But I would just, <laughs> for the per first part of the exercise, still ignore it and be like, what do we try to do and where do we want automations? And then go back to the CRM, right? So okay. even if you already have it. Fantastic. All right. So where do you go from there? Yeah. So, um, I mean, then you you basically execute, right? But, but to, to go back into more detail of like, you know, this whole, Flow charting thing. So what we what we will say is, we actually have a framework. We broke out the business into like different segments, mm -hmm. and then you can work kind of on each segment. Um, and you could start in certain places. You can do it all at once. I mean, but usually you're gonna do it iteratively. So uh, the way we like to look at it and to simplify it um, is like when people are like, okay, fine. Like you can piss me. Process is important. Like, okay, what? Well, it's overwhelming. Like, what do I do? Well, 
part of it is obviously like what I mentioned, but like as far as like specifically like where do you optimize, um, the easiest way to look at it is to look in the perspective of like, uh, you know, the most important thing in your business, which is your customers, mm -hmm. right? And what does that look like? So you kind of look at the customer journey, but this isn't a customer journey exercise. It's a, you know, how do we process each part of the customer journey, right? Um, and it's not the same thing. Somebody asked me that the, like, the other day at a class of like, you know, well, um, how does that compare to like customer journey? And it, it, the difference is that we're looking at the things that we need to do at different points, right? Not necessarily the things that the customer by by themselves are seeing, right? Which is normally what a customer journey is. A customer does this, customer gets a quote, customer does, but who sends the quote and who uh, and who follows up so, so that that quote can happen? And like, you know, where does that automation get triggered, right? So it's a little bit different in that regard. Um, but, but you'll notice that there's, People come to you, okay, they're leads. Uh, they have like some level of interest. So that's like the, the first like kind of part of it. Then they move in and, you know, once there's it's been established that like, okay, we might be able to work together. Then you have like your sales process and that's going to be like where you're, you know, providing a quote, you know, doing this and bidding a job, whatever. Um, and like following up and that's like, you know, the sales process. But then after, uh, and then after that, you know, sometimes people fall between the cracks. So you have like marketing where you can kind of use to glue the gaps, uh, which is, I think is very important. Um, I, I like to say that marketing is, is a way to glue the attention gaps uh, for your customers like along the way, um, which is, I think, a more, and I know you're talking about marketing, I think that's a more um, useful way to think about marketing because a lot of times people maybe just think marketing is like this like magic pill that's like, you know, going to get people like, you know, floating outside the door, you know, just trying to knock it down so that they can work with us. I mean, it's, it doesn't really work that way, right? Um, but, but one way that is very controlled that you can use marketing is that you already have people in a funnel and you need to keep their attention throughout the funnel. And there, there's just certain points that you, you know, you're not talking to them as much or whatever. You need to glue, you need to just put like some glue there to like keep their attention going to, to get to the next step. And marketing can be extraordinarily useful to use there, um, especially email marketing. Um, but, um, but yeah, I mean, then you have that point, right. Um, and then there's a point where you're like, okay, cool. Like we sold the customer and we're done. Right. And, um, you know, you throw the fireworks up and, uh, um, well, you're not done. Right. <laughs> we all know that's that. the beginning. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. You were looking at me like, Oh, this guy's crazy. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like when I'm showing a deck, I show like fireworks and I show like a big X on the next slide. Like, no, no, not done. Um, you're back to zero again. <laughs> yeah, <pretty laughs> you much. gotta reprove yourself. <laughs> pretty much. And that's a big thing. And I really wanted to emphasize that here. Um, cause I don't want people to think we're just talking about sales cause we're not at all. Um, nice. right. Uh, so that's the whole universe outside of that. And the, um, kickoff or onboarding or whatever you want to call it, right? The transition from sales to execution, um, that immediate transition, um, so I just call it onboarding, um, is very key. There's a lot of friction there, always, always. Um, I mean, like um, in every industry, uh, right? And construction is actually one where there's a lot. Um, you know, when you have like somebody who's selling and somebody who's like a project, project manager, and then you got to transition from one to the other. And then, you know, salesperson said some stuff, was familiar with the job, was working on the job for like a year. And the project manager maybe didn't get briefed on anything. And then all of a sudden it, they're talking to the same customer, same contractor. And then, um, uh, and then everybody's kind of like going like, what the hell's going on? Right. Um, so that happens a lot. Um, you know, and I think that's like a very, very key thing to actually focus on. Uh, sometimes even more important than sales, like, you know, uh, in this, in this case, right. But, but you, you will have to, to fix that. A lot of times you have to work backwards and go into sales because there's things that are not fixed in sales. I was given another podcast, I talking about construction and um, we were talking about that and it's just like, you know, you gotta, you gotta fix sales to fix some of that. Cause it's not uh, people, a, a little bit of attention here, but people will tend to be like, well, the project manager just sucks, but like, it's not, it's not really that it's like the process is out there. And then the salespeople also have a role in it. And, and I was a salesperson and I was, you know, part of that culture. Um, and, um, and the project manager has a role too. Right. But it's just like, everybody has a little bit of a role. Um, so, uh, so that's like really, really key. Uh, and then there's other things after that. So that's like the transition piece. Um, but then there's uh, the actual execution of the project, which is a little bit different than the onboarding. The onboarding is like just getting from one stage to another, um, that the actual execution of the project. So if you're building, if you're selling, if you're manufacturing, whatever, right. Uh, and then there is the uh, service, which is more broad, but it's more like, Hey, like I have, a, somebody comes to you and like, I have an issue, right. I have an issue, like, you know, help or I, I need help doing this or whatever, like more reactive. Um, so, uh, so you have essentially like almost like three things before and three things after somebody becomes a customer. Um, and that's kind of like a framework that we, we look at. All right. I could, you mentioned a couple of things. 
But I think what's bubbling up for me right now is time. All this stuff takes time. Mm -hmm. And everybody that I've ever worked with, we talk about time and time management. How do you manage your time? Or like, how do you maybe talk into a construction company who is just in this either three steps before or three steps after? Um, how do you, what are some of your best time management tricks? Or what well, has I been think, most effective for you? I, and this sounds kind of funny, but I think pro, uh, fixing your processes is a way to manage your time, actually, because you save a lot of time when you have better processes. Um, and, and you do, right? Because if, it, if it's like, you know, we're really good, whatever. I, I got to figure out what all my reps are doing. And it's just like, you know, I don't know. I got to call them all or, and, or piece together like a bunch of like, you know, uh, emails where we won jobs or didn't win jobs. And I got to do this like a Monday. I'm taking like three hours versus like we have a system. Everybody puts everything in, even if it's in a spreadsheet. Right. Um, and now it takes me one hour because, you know, I can just look at it and then call them if I have questions. Right. I mean, you you just bought back a lot of time. So, uh, it, you know, if you set up your processes a certain way, processes are not just about let's get more sales i mean that's part of it sometimes right uh but but a lot of times it's also about you know let's just get more efficiency and efficiency usually translates into you know easier way to do things and or money and or time right so um the um and that's the thing i really like about processes is that unlike anything else you could do in business um Processes is the one where everything pretty much is in your court, um, which which is nice. So like if you do, you can go to like a trade show, into like a lot of trade shows. You can go to a trade show. You can get the nicest table, do the nicest thing, right? And like, you know, it's an expensive trade show. You paid like a fortune for the ticket, you know, and you buy your team and, you know, whatever. And you have like a nice product. And then people don't show up because like whatever. It was on a Wednesday and nobody felt like going, right? Or like it was raining or whatever, right? Like it happens, right? And it's a kind of like a amongst like manufacturers, it's kind of like a kind of like a little bit of a not joke but like it's like yeah like sometimes trade shows you're just there and you're just talking to other manufacturers and that that's kind of the extent of it right um yeah it happens sometimes they're really good sometimes they're, not, they're hit or miss right so um it, the ball is not fully in your court you could have done everything right and it just you know just whatever right with processes though it's it's as much as it gets in in the world like the ball is pretty much fully in your court so it's as close as you're going to get to like a guaranteed roi as anything you'll ever do in your business because everything is already things that are already happening to your business you're already getting these customers they're already talking to you your sales reps are already engaging you know are you getting their leads or whatever and you already need to transition these people and now it's like you're giving them better experience so they're more likely to come back especially if it's a referral based business right that onboarding piece really helps you're also um you're also um uh what's it called uh um uh, you're uh, you're giving them better experience uh, i don't know why i lost my train of thought um and then you're um you're able to save a lot of time on like servicing these customers and like, you know, but by yourself like this efficiency, which is again, the most valuable resource, right? Time. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, and you're able to uh, potentially save money along the way because, you know, you're just able to service more with the same amount of resources. So I think that um, this is like a very um, guaranteed ROI as close as possible to it. And that's why I get really excited about this. I know it is fun. I've seen it work before and I'm like, Oh gosh, when I see an opportunity, I'm like, we really need to document it down. And then here I am documenting my processes in my own business. And I'm like, oh, I don't like doing this at all. Like, this is not fun. But I need that because how do I communicate to somebody else who's supporting me when I need to delegate and push it out? There's no yeah. other way to be able to do it more effectively. What are your thoughts around delegation when it comes to time management, when it comes to processes, all that good stuff? What are your thoughts around delegation? And Yeah, I mean, like... I would say, I mean, obviously, I think having the process helps you delegate. I wouldn't, as like a, if you're like a major stakeholder in the business or like the operator of the business, you know, um, or, or executive or whatever, right? I, I wouldn't fully delegate out the whole process project, right? I would be involved on some of Obviously, you're going to delegate some of it. You're bringing stakeholders, whatever, but I would be involved in some of it because I think it's just like really, really important uh to get that framework right but like once the framework is right that actually allows you more opportunities to delegate things like right it's like okay you know instead of having the sales reps make 100 calls on monday well we can have the other back office do it because like a lot of times people are just not even answering and like we just leave voicemail so we'll have the back office do it and then when we connect we'll have the sales reps follow up uh right for example and now we can kind of delegate like more efficiently right it, it, you know or maybe you're doing something and it's like hey i don't want to do this you know i'm going to delegate this to like one of my managers or one of whoever right um so i, I think 
um, having that process in place allows you opportunities to delegate. I wouldn't delegate out the entire. Uh, I, I think you should have whatever process you're working on. You should have like the relevant stakeholders. You cannot be involved 100% of the time, but at least be involved on some level. If you're working on, you know, the onboarding process, you want people from, you know, the sales side, sales leadership, and you know, project ex execution leadership to be on in some way. It could be the same person, it could be not, but you want them to be on in some way um, and driving that conversation because you want. And that's a, that's a that's a big thing that's missed a lot of times. Like we see this happens in corporate a lot, where it's like, yeah, this, you know. And, and you said you came from a bank, uh, so it's gonna be interesting. Where it's like, hey, so and so came from like you know Wall Street or bank or whatever, and now he's in charge of like you know everything, and you know he's gonna build all these processes. And then it's like, okay, okay, put the brakes. <laughs> Uh, do you know anything about construction? <laughs> do you have any idea? Like, it's not the same thing at all, as, you know, and, and a lot of times they don't. Right. And it's just like, you know, that's fine. If you actually bring in stakeholders and people who are actually doing the job and get their take. But if you don't, then it ends up being like just something right on a piece of paper that means nothing to anybody, it, you know, except you maybe. Um, and then uh, people will see through that. And especially if you have, you know, big teams are going to see through that and they're going to just skirt it because ultimately. Right. So there's a big human element to this, too. Like, you know, especially when you have big teams or think with big teams, or with corporate, when you think with, you know, uh, just a large organization, you have to do it in a way where the people feel like. Not that they got everything they want 100% because then you're not going to do anything, right? They maybe just wanted to say the way it is. But at the same time, it's like, oh, okay. I mean, this at least makes sense. Like they took into factor this and this and this that we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And like, all right, fine, whatever. I'll do it, right? Like you don't want them to be like, this was made by somebody who like doesn't even know what we're talking about. And like, this is a waste of my time. And they're not to it. And, and I've seen that a lot. All right. So as we kind of start to wrap up, we talked a lot about work and I can't help but notice some of these phone calls, most of the phone calls I get on with my clients. I'll ask them, what are they doing for fun? Because we work really hard, but are we making sure that we put fun in there as well? So I'm going to throw it out to you. What's something fun that you're either doing or you're looking forward to? Yeah. I mean, I like to uh, go on vacations and stuff with my, uh, you know, family and wife and kids um so uh i'd say that i have kids uh and uh, playing with them also is, is like a good way to have fun and also bond with your kids sometimes i'll play a game with my kids so sometimes i'll you know go outside take them somewhere you know whatever so i think that's that's kind of a good way i try to channel it through uh my kids uh, which is nice and my kids are like younger so it's like uh you're kind of like living as if you were a kid too, because like they want you to, you know, play with them in uh, like a kiddish way. And, you know, I don't, I don't mind that. <laughs> I like that. So, um, uh, so I think that, that, that's, that's kind of a, a cool way. So vacationing and spending time with the kids, uh, mainly uh, at this stage in life. right? <laughs> yeah. It's all different stages. I know like this weekend, all the neighborhood kids came over and they built a fort in the backyard with the trampoline. And that was like a that's big success. Awesome. So, I was like, oh, man, that's pretty cool. I remember doing that when I was a kid. And it's just cool to get to see them get excited about it and kind of relive it. And the irony is, is when the fun is happening, usually solutions just bubble up in my <laughs> subconscious of things that I have been trying to figure out. I don't know. Does that happen with you? Oh, for sure. For sure. A lot of times. And uh, I tell this, I have, um, you know, I have friends. I mean, obviously, a lot of friends in, in business. And, you know, um, a lot of times it's like I'll tell people, like, listen you gotta you gotta slow down and then be like oh i have all these things to do and I'm like i gotta do this thing i run the business and i gotta do this and i gotta do this and i'm like yes but the thing is that you don't notice is that if you don't give yourself any break at all and i'm not saying massive breaks right but if you don't give yourself any break at all and i've experienced this firsthand i was doing like a bunch of different things um at some point and um taking courses studying you know doing like a million things at the same time uh, and it was bad. Uh, and if you don't, if you don't give yourself some sort of break, you're just, you're just go like this. And then, you know, you, the break would be more than free, like actually for you. So you, you're going to feel better. Um, and, and you're going to actually get more done on aggregate because, you know, your brain is not like constantly on. Right. It's, it's kind of, I, I always think of it like, I don't know, imagine like a gear on a car, like kind of like a maybe a manual car or whatever. And you're just like running the same gear all the time. And like the, the metal for the gear, like never leaves the engine or, you know, however way. Right. Um, but like, I'm kind of imagining it like that. And it's just like, always like this, the gear just is definitely going to like blow off at some point. Right. Um, that's kind of like the same way you got to disconnect the gear a little bit. Right. You got to just disconnect the gear a little bit. Um, even if it's like, Hey, you're like, I'm so busy. 
well, like take Friday night and do something like right with your family or whatever for like a couple hours, you know, or you know, watch something or, or play something or, you know, play a sport, play a game, play whatever you like to do, um, you know, and you'll be more effective. So I think, uh, yeah, for sure. I, I agree with that. Awesome. I call them like right. uh, micro micro breaks. <laughs> micro breaks are, are extremely important. Mm. They're, they're vital in life. I think mm. just to be able to have that moment of reflection and, um, turning off and just kind of sitting and being present. It yeah, changes yeah. things, I think, for the good. So sure. if somebody wants to learn more about you, the work that you're doing, how do they get in touch with you? you yeah, yeah. So uh, I know we talked a lot about construction, but we, we work yeah. with all sorts of Well, businesses. I love construction. Yeah. And then we talked about it. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. <laughs> no, for sure. I love construction. I mean, uh, if you're a construction or if you're not construction, uh, we work with other types of businesses too, B2B software, healthcare, um, you know, small businesses, services, all this stuff. So, uh, but anyways, feel free to reach out uh, and we can talk specifically about your business. We can do a consult. So you could reach out to us at hello, just the word hello, at pushanalytics.com. And put in the title that you came from this podcast, and then the team will route to me, and uh, we can do like a you know twenty minute conversation consult. We can talk about whatever you want in your business, and uh, you know we can help you kind of make more practical sense of this because this is always going to be specific to your business. I mean, we're giving like general tips here and framework, but ultimately, um, it's always specific to your business. Um, and that's that's the way to really get process to work for you. you. You don't borrow somebody else's. You can take tips, but you you make it you build it for your own business. Perfect. All right, Mustafa Morsi, you are the president of Push Analytics, found on the web at pushanalytics.com. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's great. Thanks for listening to the episode. If you like it, please subscribe, share this episode or this show with other people around you. The greatest form of a compliment is a referral. I really appreciate this. And if you think that you want to learn more about some of the work we're doing, I encourage you to reach out to katherinecanty.com. You can schedule a call or just continue to read articles and information that we post out there. Thank you so much for being here.